thanks and praise team for that wonderful reminder. The power of God is at work in us, changing us. He doesn't leave us static. He doesn't leave us to just completely on our own to figure out this, this walk with him. He is at work actively. What an amazing tree. Thank you, praise team. Well, this morning we're starting a new series of sermons in the Old Testament book of Esther. And if you are not familiar with the book of Esther, uh, just take your Bible about halfway in. It'll put you somewhere around Psalms or Proverbs, and then just start turning back towards the front cover. You'll see the book of Psalms, you'll see the book of Job, and then you'll come to the Old Testament book of Esther. And I'm calling this sermon series, Are You There, God? I've I've mentioned over the last several weeks that the book of Esther never directly mentions God by name, never talks specifically about what he is doing. And I had said, as we talked about that, I said that it's the only book in the Bible that doesn't mention God by name, but that's incorrect. And I was reminded this week as I was studying that the, the book of Song of Solomon also does not mention God by name. But it's a critical feature in the book of Esther. In fact, it's the foundational thought for this sermon series. Because very often as we go through the events of life, when we just go through walking through this life, we, we find ourselves at times a little bit like Esther thrown into a situation we don't have a plan for, that we don't feel like we're prepared for, and we're not really certain we have the capabilities to to carry out the the thing that God has put in front of us. And then on top of that, we don't necessarily see the, the overt signs that God is here and God is at work. And sometimes we find ourselves exactly like Esther. And we wonder in those moments, are you still there? Are you still involved in this? I can't see you. I can't sense you here. Are you still here? So to get us started this morning, turn with me to Esther chapter 2. I trust you found the book already. Flip over to the second chapter. And we're going to try to take on the entire chapter this morning. I realize some many Sundays I have a hard time keeping in time with just a few verses. And this morning, we're going to try to plow through the entire chapter. But you realize something as you read through Esther. And if you've never read through the book, let me encourage you to do it. If at no other time while we're going through the book of Esther these next several weeks, read through the book of Esther. Ten short chapters in my Bible, it's six and, or five and a half pages, so it won't take you long to read through it. But as you read through it, you discover something. And that is that Esther is not the main character. I mean, from a, from a human perspective, the book is about her. It's about the adventures, if you will, of, of what Esther goes through. But she's not really the main character. Though God is not mentioned, God is the main character of that book. And you only get that perspective, really, in Esther. It's not a book where you can just read a paragraph, a short piece, a little, a little verse or a little passage and say, I've got the thought out of that. So Esther's not really a book that's designed like that. It's one long story from start to finish. And really, the only way to get that proper perspective of who God is and what he's doing and how he is at work is to take these, take it in large chunks, take the story as it comes. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. Start with this large chunk of chapter 2. And I think the big idea of chapter 2, and maybe this is the big idea of Esther as a whole and certainly the big idea of this sermon series, is that if we look for them, that is a big if, if we look for them, we see the evidences of God's hand at work. In the events of our lives. But we have to look for them. And we also we almost see God moving people and moving events kind of like pieces on a chessboard. And that's kind of the motif we're going to look at Esther chapter 2 with this morning. This idea of God moving the pieces like pieces on a chessboard. So I trust you've had time to find Esther chapter 2. We're going to hit 23 verses in what I believe now is 23 minutes I have left. So we've got a bit of a challenge ahead of us. So let's dive right in. Thinking about this idea of God moving the events, orchestrating events, and moving people around like pieces on a chessboard. I think the first thing we see here in Esther chapter 2 is that God moves the king. Now, if you've ever played chess, and I'm certainly no grandmaster, but I do enjoy the game. If you've ever played chess, you realize that the king is probably the last piece you'd move. And in fact, if you're playing chess and you're at all familiar with it, if you have to move your king, it means you're in trouble. It means you've lost everything else. You've lost all of your defenses, and now you're kind of fighting for your survival, and so you're moving your king just to prolong the inevitability of you losing the game. You're in trouble if you have to move the king. It's the last thing that you would do. But we're reminded 
just as we go through the course of life all the time that God seldom does things the way we do them. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And the things that we would instinctively do, the way that we would instinctively react, God doesn't react that way very often. He doesn't do things like we would do. And here's one place. The first piece that God moves here is the king. Verse 1 of Esther chapter 2. Now after these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the king's attendants who served him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. And let the king appoint overseers in all the provinces of the kingdom so that they may gather every beautiful young virgin to the citadel of Susa, to the harem, into the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, let their cosmetics be given to them. And let the young lady who pleases the king be queen in place of Vashti. And the matter pleased the king, and he did accordingly. Now he starts chapter 2, the, the, the author of Esther, we don't know who that is. It wasn't Esther, we know that much, but we don't really know who wrote Esther. Starts chapter 2 with that phrase, after these things. These things is kind of a summary of everything that happened back there in chapter 1. Chapter 1 begins the first couple of verses of chapter 1. The king holds this six-month military planning session. That's kind of what it looks like. That's what most commentators believe is happening at the beginning of chapter 1. We know what happened six months. He's got all of his princes, all of his, his court officials there. He's got all of the military officers of the Medes and the Persians gathered in one place. And he has this six-month-long military planning session. Now, the historical backdrop to what is happening here, so you can kind of tie this to history, link this to a, a period of time in history, is that King Xerxes, that's what he's known at in, in history. If you've ever studied ancient history, you'll see that name come up. He was the king at the height of the, the pinnacle of the Persian Empire, King Xerxes. That's the same king we're talking about here. He is preparing to attack Greece. He's going to avenge his father, King Darius. You remember him from the book of Daniel. He's going to avenge his father, a critical loss Darius had at the hand of the Greeks. And King Xerxes is, is preparing to, to wage war against the Greeks. If you've seen the movie 300, does that, that movie is about the 300 Spartans, them holding out at the Battle of Thermopylae. That battle is at the end of this war that King Xerxes is planning there at the beginning of chapter 1. And he, and he finishes this six-month planning session, and he has this wild, drunken bash. In fact, the remainder of chapter 1 is about the wild, drunken bash, and so you can kind of see where the king's priorities were in life. And, and as he goes along, the king gets just absolutely lit up during this bash, and he decides in his drunkenness that it's a great idea to have his wife, Vashti, who is very beautiful, come and parade in front of all of his equally drunk friends. He thinks that's a great idea. As you can imagine, Vashti is not a fan of the idea. Vashti flat out refuses. And he's enraged at her public disobedience. And so he, he has the king banished, or the queen banished. She will no longer be queen. And you think, well, that was a bit of an irrational response. That was a bit of an over-the-top response. But that's the kind of guy that this king was, Xerxes. That's the kind of man he was. In fact, there's a, a story, a Greek historian records this story, that one time he was leading his, his troops into battle. And they had, they had built these bridges, as engineers did, built these bridges over a certain body of water they had, to, they had to cross to get into this battle. And as they were coming up on that, as they were making their advance, a storm kicked up and the surge took out these bridges. He was so enraged at what happened, he had all of his engineers beheaded right there on the spot. And then he took his, some of his soldiers, he gave them whips and told them to go and whip the water for its disobedience. That's the kind of guy, in his anger, King Xerxes was absolutely irrational. After these things, as the writer starts chapter 2, is actually four years after that event. Xerxes has, has led his army into battle against the Greeks and quite frankly got his tail kicked by the Greeks. And he comes back, he's licking his wounds, he, and he, he suddenly realizes there's nobody here to console him, and he suddenly realizes he misses his queen, Vashti. And his advisors come up with this plan in verse 2. And they say, hey, we got an idea. Let's, let's gather all of the pretty young ladies in town, all the pretty young virgins. Let's bring them here 
Well, let the king try them out, for lack of a better phrase. Let him choose a new queen from that. And this king, Ahasuerus, Xerxes, is a filthy pagan lust bucket. So from his perspective, this is a great idea. He's all over this plan. Brings all of the, the virgins in for this idea. Now you might say, okay, that, that's, that's, that's great historical background. Great information about what is happening here. But right now, all you've described are, are the actions of an overambitious, pagan, immoral king. And quite frankly, history is full of those clowns. So I really don't see how the hand of God is at work in any of this up to this point. But let's take a step back for just a minute. If the book of Esther is nothing else, it is a book about the sovereignty of God. You know, we don't see God mentioned. We don't hear him being talked about, but it's a story about God's sovereignty. Now, remember, I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago. Sovereignty is one of those 50-cent seminary words that we talk about a lot in church. And sovereignty really just means this, that God is in charge of all things, all people, and all events. Throughout all of history, God is in charge of everything. There is nothing that happened in history, nothing that is happening right now, nothing that will happen in the future that escapes God's notice, and that God didn't either cause directly or allow to take place. God is absolutely sovereign, absolutely in charge of all things. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, he said, No attribute of God is more comforting to his children than that of his sovereignty. Now, I realize when we talk about the sovereignty of God, that God is in charge of all things, that brings up some difficult thoughts in our mind, right? Some historical things that happen that are very difficult to square with the idea of a loving, sovereign God. It brings up some difficult thoughts. It raises some difficult questions. But those things in history, those difficult periods that probably popped into your mind, as even as I mentioned that, even the difficult things and some of the, frankly, horrible things we see happening in the world now. Those things are even more difficult to comprehend if they serve no purpose. But if we realize there is a God, a loving, powerful God behind all of those events, well, then we realize I may not understand the purpose. I may not see the purpose. I may not be able to pinpoint it. Maybe I never will in this life. But I trust the God who is behind them. And I trust that there is a purpose because his word tells me that there is. Those events are even harder to imagine if they serve no purpose. It's just random evil at work in this world. That's why Spurgeon said that the, the attribute of God, of his sovereignty, is comforting to his children. When I don't know why, I know who. And we see that in the book of Esther. It's a story about God's sovereignty. So let's take that step back and say, what was God up to in the shenanigans of this irrational, immoral king? Well, first of all, I think we have to recognize that even the fact that Xerxes is king at this point in history is not a coincidence. It's not an accident. It is a movement of the hand of God. You say, well, he was the son of the previous king. Isn't that the way it works? That, that, that's the one that ascends to the throne? But if you've ever studied any history, you know it doesn't always work that way. In fact, a lot of times it doesn't work that way. Assassination plots and jealousy and all that stuff gets in the way, and sometimes the son of the king doesn't end up on the throne. But God in his sovereignty, he allows Xerxes to become the king of the Persian Empire. Daniel said this in Daniel chapter 2, verse 21. He said, God deposes kings and he raises up others. And Paul would remind us centuries later, Romans chapter 13, that all authority comes from the hand of God. There is no authority in this world that God has not said, yes, that's the one that I will put in that place at that point in time. God allows Xerxes to become king. He puts this man who has this violent temper and, and a short fuse and quite frankly becomes irrational <laughs> when he is angry, and God puts that man in charge for that moment so that his irrationality would create a job opening in the position of queen within the empire. And this alternate plan of his advisors, for them it was about saving their necks, 
You see, they knew that if, if Vashti came in later on, she probably would be on board with some of the evil plans that were suggested to them. They knew that. They were the ones that suggested to the king that he should run Vashti off. For them, they looked at this idea. They said, we've got to come up with a new plan. We cannot allow the king in his loneliness to bring Vashti in. For us, that surely will be one of those Alice in Wonderland moments. Off with their heads. That's what's going to happen if she comes back in. To come up with this other plan. For them, it's about saving their necks. But we see God working behind the scenes as you read through the story. He is orchestrating events so that this one person, Esther, will be in a position to one day save his people in a way that Vashti never would. That alternate plan of them was, theirs was, was not just their plan. God was moving things along. And without being the author of their sin, without being directly involved in making them make those sinful choices god directed the situation so that his purpose would be accomplished and we see him we peel that back we look behind the curtain so to speak we see god moving in that way and that's the way god often works in circumstances he's not the author of sin but he uses even the sinful decisions of mankind to accomplish his purpose we just celebrated that last sunday right perhaps the greatest example of that we just celebrated last Sunday, where God used the sinful choices of man to accomplish his plan of salvation on the cross and ultimate resurrection of Christ. We just celebrated how God works in that regard. And what these men intended for evil, God used for good. We see his hand moving behind the scenes as he's moving the king. The other piece, though, that God moves on this grand chessboard is that God moves the queen doesn't just move the king he moves the queen as well he's already moved one queen he's moved Vashti on off the scene he's already moved one and now he's fixing to move another one in the form of Esther and we have to train ourselves to see things that way because the events that we encounter in life are very often like they play out Esther is, is very much a true to form sort of life story and we have to train ourselves and consistently remind ourselves that God is at work. We sing in that song, God will make a way. He's at work in ways we cannot see. And we have to consistently train ourselves to do that, that even in the routine things of life, to see them in light of who God is, in light of this sovereign, all-powerful God. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, when you seek me, you will find me. We can't just walk through life blindly just expecting that God will magically appear and, and, and reveal himself at all the moments. We have to seek him to see them in those moments so that God moved the queen. And we're introduced to the first two main actors in this play, verses 5 through 7. He said, Now there was at the citadel of Susa a Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the sh son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been taken into exile from Jerusalem with the captives, who had been exiled with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had exiled. And he was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, <clears throat> for she had no father or mother. Now when the young, lady, the young lady was beautiful of form and face, and when her father and mother had died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. We're given Mordecai's family tree there a little bit. We're kind of told his, his lineage a little bit, that he is the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. And we won't really see the full significance of that until next week. We'll come to chapter 3, and we'll see this grand showdown between Mordecai and the other key player in this story, a man named Haman. And that showdown begins to play out in chapter 3. We'll start to see the full significance of this little family tree we're given of Mordecai's here. I don't think it was to convince us that he's a Jew. There's something way more significant about it than that. And what we're going to see next week when we look at that, I just want you to log this in. We'll pull this back out next Sunday. Mordecai is of the same tribe as the first king of Israel, Saul, who, by the way, Saul's father's name was also Kish. And whether the, the author is trying to draw a link there and say that Mordecai is of a direct descendant of Saul or not, I'm not really certain. But he ne nevertheless, he is of the same tribe as the first king of Israel, Saul. Saul was a Benjamite. And next week, we're going to see this amazing connection there in chapter 3. 
between Mordecai, a descendant of the tribe of Benjamin, Saul's reign as king, this man Haman and his lineage, and how all of that comes together to fulfill a long-standing promise of God toward his people. And so I want you to stay tuned. There's your cliffhanger for the week. So st- you'll have to come back next week and see how all that plays out. But, but back to this, the story of how God moved the queen. Mordecai and Esther were told are Jews. And it seems that we know something in the story now that the rest of the players in the story don't know. Mordecai doesn't reveal he's a Jew over until chapter 3, verse 4. So at this point in the story, we're told they're Jews. Nobody else knows that. Esther doesn't reveal her lineage, doesn't reveal she's a Jew until over in chapter 7. Now, it it doesn't seem like they lied about it, no indication they lied about their lineage. Verse 2 of chapter, or verse 10, rather, of chapter 2, it just says that Esther didn't make known her people or her kindred. Same thing in verse 20. Twice we're told that. That means it's it's a significant data point to what is happening here. It doesn't look like they've lied about it. They just conceal their identity. They don't reveal their nationality as Jews. And Esther is rounded up along with the rest of the pretty young virgins in town, brought into the, into the palace, into the king's harem. And now Haggai is the, the guy in charge of the harem. He likes Esther, takes to her for some reason. He, he takes a shining to Esther. And so he treats her better than the rest of the women. And when her turn finally comes, For her to to go into the king and spend her night with the king. The king likes her too. We're told that in verse 17. It says in my translation, the king loved Esther. I think NIV translates that better. He was attracted to Esther more than he was the rest of the women. The, The king takes a liking to Esther as well. She becomes queen. So once again, those are the events, sort of a synopsis. We don't have time to go through all of that. There's a summation of the events of what happens, verses 5 to 18 of Esther chapter 2. So let's take another step back and say, those are the events. How is God working behind the scene? Let's move the curtain aside and see what God is doing back there. Well, first of all, there is this matter of Esther finding favor with Haggai. You ever had one of those situations where you meet somebody and you just click? You know, there's just something about that person. We just get along. We just click. I I can't put my finger on what it is. But there's something there, some kind of chemistry, something. This guy, Haggai, no doubt plays a key role in in Esther finding favor with the king. He is in charge of the king's harem. He would have known what the king likes, would have known what the king doesn't like. Back in verse 15, he advises Esther before she goes in to be with the king. So no doubt he played a key role in her finding favor with the king. And there's something about that. We're not told that Esther did anything specific that he should like her. Just that he did. Verse 9 just says that he did. And we might look at those times when we say, well, gosh, it was fortunate, right, that I just happened to click with that person that was so influential. It certainly was lucky that Esther had this connection, somehow clicked with this guy who became so influential in her life. What What a great coincidence that was we could look at it that way and we might be tempted to but once again we have to see things in the light of god working behind the scenes remember the leroy jethro gibbs rule number 39 right there are no coincidences and that is as true i think in the make-believe world of fighting crime as it is in the lives of god's children God is at work behind the scenes, as Paul said in Romans chapter 8, working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Not just some things, not just the big things, even in what seems like the insignificant details of life, God is working those. And those times when we see something like that and we say, well, gosh, that was certainly fortunate that she found favor with that guy. How lucky... Esther was to have found favor with that guy. What a great coincidence that was. We realize when we see that through the eyes and the lens of God's children, a powerful, sovereign God who is the master of his universe at work in that scene. We say that's not a coincidence at all. That's a divine appointment. 
that God worked in that way so that they clicked in a way the author doesn't even try to explain. They just hit it off. Maybe here's the takeaway. If God can work like that, in the heart and the mind of this unbelieving Persian harem keeper, he's a pimp. And if God can work in his mind and in his heart like that, is there any place that God can't work? Is there any person that God cannot move in their heart? Is there anyone, any situation in which God could not work if he could work here? We realize that even today, God is at work in people and in places and in ways that, that sometimes we might think initially he's absent. But there are, there are no things in this world where God is absent. God is not at work moving his plan forward. We see God at work that way in moving the queen. You know where else his hand is at work, I think, is in the concealing of their nationality. I mentioned it's, it's mentioned two times in this passage, in this chapter. That means it's important for us to pay attention to. Remember, if God mentions something once in his word, it's important enough for us to notice. If he mentions it more than once, we really ought to notice it. And we're told twice in this chapter that she conceals her nationality. She had a chance. And what that means is they were not practicing Jews. There's no way that any, if they were been practicing the dietary laws, practicing the, the worship laws of the Jews, that would have been noticed they were Jews. They were not practicing Jews. She doesn't lie about her identity. They just said nothing. And the author doesn't comment on that. Did you notice that? Verse 10, verse 20. When, when the author mentions that, that she does not reveal she's a Jew, he doesn't comment on that. He doesn't say, and God was displeased with Esther because she didn't reveal her identity. Almost gives the impression that God was almost neutral to the idea, and I couldn't help but to think of Moses at that point. Remember, the identity of Moses was concealed. In fact, God had gone to great lengths to conceal the identity of who Moses was, his lineage, his heritage. God concealed that purposely until his chosen point in time. And when God finally chose to, to reveal the identity of Moses, that was a critical piece in him using Moses to be a deliverer of his people. And the same thing happens in the life of Esther. As we fast forward into that story, if you're at all familiar with it, we fast forward into that story, chapter 7, when she finally reveals her identity as a Jew. That is, a, again, a critical piece in God's plan that he will use to save his people. I couldn't help but to see that as something that God moved in a specific way. In Mordecai's heart, to tell Esther, reveal, don't reveal that at this point in time. That will come out later. It's something we need to use later, but right now, we do not. When we push back the curtain on, on this story, we see God's hand moving in these events. God moved the queen for such a time as this, as she would come to realize. And the last thing I want us to see is that God moved the knight, the little horsey if you're not a chess player, the knight on the chessboard. What's the role of the knight? either in chess or just in a, a palace in general, what's the role of the knight? It's to protect the king, right? That's what they're there for. That's why they wear them horribly uncomfortable-looking suits of armor. They're there to protect the king. That's the role of the knight. And that's exactly the role that Mordecai finds himself in, verses 19 to 23, protecting the king. Now, again, the timeline here, we're not really told the timing of these things, but the events in verses 5 to 18... That probably took about a year and a half, a year, a year and a half, somewhere in that, in that span of time. We know that every one of those young ladies was, was in that harem for a year before they went in to the king. A minimum, it took a year. and We don't have any idea how many ladies were in that harem. Somewhere, probably between 12 to 18 months is how long verses 5 to 18 took. And we come to verse 19, the next time we hear about Mordecai is verse 19. And where we see him there is significant. At this point, Mordecai, we're told in verse 19, he's now sitting in the city gate. Now, for you and I today, that doesn't mean a whole lot. But for them and their culture, that meant a great deal. All of the business of the town was done at the city gate. All of the, the disputes that took place 
were resolved at the city gate. If they needed wisdom on how to move forward, how to do something, they consulted the elder, elders of the town who sat in the city gate. And the fact that Mordecai is there means that at this point, maybe a year and a half later, Mordecai has gone from just another guy in town to now he's in this high position of honor, this high position of authority as he's sitting there in the city gate. And while he's there, he learns about an assassination plot. Now, given that king's temperament and him ordering his soldiers to go whip the water for his insubordination when he's angry, given the fact his temperament, his irrational behavior when he was mad, it's not, it's not too hard a stretch to, to think that he made some enemies along the way, probably a fair number of them. As Mordecai sits in the, the gate, he hears about this assassin, assassination plot. And he reports it, and he foils the plot. And then there's this little comment in verse 23. Now, when the plot was investigated, it's found to be so. They were both hanged on the gallows, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles in the king's presence. That almost seems like a throwaway comment, sort of a routine thing that, that happened all the time. Everything that happened, any significant, would have been written in that book of the Chronicles. In fact, I just got finished reading First and Second Kings in my, in my quiet time in the morning and how often that phrase was at the end of a king's life and all of the other things that King X and such did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles? It's a pretty routine matter for them to record things. It almost seems like it's a, a throwaway comment and it was written in the book of the Chronicles. Now, once again, one last time, let us pull that curtain back. That's sort of the events of what took place. Mordecai sitting in the gate doing his job. Here's this assassination plot. Reports it. The plot is foiled. Let's pull the curtain back again and see how God is at work. Turning the dials, pushing the buttons. It's very likely Esther got Mordecai his job. That's what landed him there in the first place. We get no indication in the text that Mordecai had any qualifications other than the fact that he was a Jew. He had no business, no business qualifications were told about, no wisdom specifically that were told about that would land him in that position of great authority or great power in the city. It's very likely Esther got him his job. And that's really how things worked anyway. It was more about who you knew than what you knew. And so Esther uses her position, her influence to get him his job. And you see how the dominoes have lined up to this point that God puts this irrational king in place. He moves Vashti out of the way. He moves Esther into a place where she then will become the queen. So she can use her influence to get her uncle Mordecai a job, or cousin Mordecai a job. Mordecai will just happen to be in the right place doing that job where he will hear of this assassination plot. Do you see how the dominoes have fallen into place up to this point? God has lined those things up. And I think there's a, there's a reminder there of this mysterious mix between the, sovereign, the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. We can't just take a, a let go and let God attitude towards life. Mordecai had the opportunity here to do what was right, and he did it. He took that opportunity. There's a reminder there. That yes, God is at work behind the scenes in ways that we can't even begin to explain. But we also have a responsibility to do right. We also have a responsibility to act in those circumstances. As Paul reminded the Galatians, never tire of doing good. And there's a reminder there of, of this situation with Mordecai. And then there's this little throwaway comment in verse 23. That, uh, that event being recorded in the chronicles of the king will become the critical pivot point that God will use to change the king's mind and turn events around from, from what seems to be certain destruction of the Jews to not only raising up Mordecai, but deliverance of the Jews and destruction of the enemy that would come against them. That becomes a critical turning point in the story. Now, I realize that's a lot of ground that we've covered this morning, plowing through chapter 2 and really kind of just skimming across the surface. But when we peel that, that curtain back, we kind of peel that onion back, so to speak, and look at these seemingly insignificant events of life. 
But we can sometimes look at those and say, I don't see God at work, therefore he must not be. I was reminded of that this past week. I was on a bicycle ride one morning. I usually do that. I ride out to the south gate, the big traffic circle, ride back here toward the church. And usually when I turn around, I've got this this magnificent view of these mountains. I'm riding right towards them. And you remember the weather this week was not so good. And one day I had turned around, I was coming back, and there was a storm that was coming in over those mountains, and the clouds were, had laid a little bit low over them. And I couldn't see the mountains. I could see them every other day. They're out there today. They're absolutely beautiful like they always are, but I couldn't see them that one day. But, you know, just because I couldn't see them doesn't mean they weren't there. It doesn't mean they had suddenly left. It doesn't mean all of a sudden they were gone because they were clouded and hidden and I couldn't see them. The story of Esther is that for us. Just because we don't see in a, in a very obvious way, just because we don't see the hand of God at work doesn't mean that it is not. And Esther reminds us it's not a question of whether God is still there, but will we choose to see him? in those events. And I don't, I don't know what's in front of you today. I don't know what you faced this past week or what you face in the coming days. I don't know what's in front of you. But whatever it is, know that God is at work even in some of what seems like the most insignificant details of life. He is working in those details not only for your good, but ultimately for his glory. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you once again. We come to your word and we ask that critical question, are you still there? Are you involved? I, I can't see you. I don't feel you at work. When we face those situations in life, Lord, we thank you that you are there. Your word promises you'll never leave us, you'll never forsake us. You walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, and no matter what is happening, even what seem like the most insignificant details, your hand is still at work. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Lord, as we move now into this time of invitation, Father, there may be one here this morning that does not have the assurance that you're working that way in your life because your promise is you do that for those who love you submitted to your purpose in their lives and fathers we move into this time of invitation there's one here today that doesn't know you as lord and savior father would you continue to draw them to you today and your children here for those times that we have forgotten that you're at work questioned you asked you whether you still know what's going on father i just pray you continue to help us to bring those matters before you for forgiveness and restoration. Father, would you continue to move in these next few moments, we pray in Jesus' name.